welcome to the third and final breakout session of the day. We will be discussing tips and tricks of daily living, and as with previous sessions, we'll leave 15 minutes at the end for questions. We're pleased to welcome today's speakers, Dr. Sarah Feldman and Mark Gorin from the MDA ALS Center of Hope at Temple University. Sarah Feldman is the physical therapist and assistive technology professional at the MDA ALS Center of Hope at Temple University, Lewis Katz School of Medicine. She has been the physical therapist at the ALS Center since 1994, and in addition to clinical care, she is involved in clinical trials and the use of assistive technology. She is a co-founder of the Northeast ALS Consortium, NEALS, Physical Therapy Committee, and served as the clinical evaluator representative on the NEALS Executive Committee from 2013 to 2018. She served on the board of directors of the International Alliance of ALS MND Associations from 2013 to 2019 and co-chairs the Allied Professionals Forum. In 2018, she received the inaugural International Allied Health Professional Award. She looks forward to the day there is a cure for ALS, but until that time, we'll continue to be the advocate for better care. Mark is both an occupational therapist and a certified hand therapist. He has over 20 years of experience working with patients and families living with ALS. Mark credits the multidisciplinary team at Temple University's ALS Center of Hope for years of experience providing care from initial onset to end stage ALS. Mark and Sarah, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Do we, uh, do we have five minutes extra at the end for that long introduction? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sarah Feldman. Yes, I'm the physical therapist. And Mark and I have actually worked together for, I would say, 25 years at least um, at the center. So during that time, uh, we've learned a lot from people living with ALS about different tips and tricks that they've done and used. So what we thought today is we'd start with some of what we normally recommend, what you might expect a physical therapist or an occupational therapist to recommend. And then we'll go into a little bit more about, we'll take that one step forward into what they might have said to us or, or recommendations they might make. As a physical therapist, what I talk to people about is their mobility. I tend to focus, as you mentioned earlier, Natasha, on the legs, yes, and Mark focuses on the arms. And how we work it at the clinic is I'll talk to you about your big mobility, how you're getting around, how you're getting from place to place, and then Mark will talk to you about what you do once you get there. That's it in a nutshell. You want to say anything about occupational therapy? Oh, yeah, well, I think that says it all. You're the next few oh, slides. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, so, uh, some people uh, do not know the difference between an occupational therapist and a physical therapist. I think everyone's a physical therapist. Like someone mentioned Kleenex before for tissues. So, I will use that example uh, often. Um, so, part of my role is to educate people about uh, what occupational therapist is, who we are, what we do. So, at the MDA ALS Center of Hope at Temple University, uh, the OT there. Uh, will often recommend a variety of different devices that help a person uh, with their daily activities, uh, ADLs, if you would, activities of daily living. There's a myriad of uh, tools, equipment, techniques, you know, that uh, we discuss in order to help a person uh, throughout the progression of their disease. <clears throat> oh. Oops, next uh, oh my goodness, okay. Hit this one. Okay, so I was mentioning activities of daily living, and um, you know, typically, uh, the normal person uh, will uh, perform these activities on a daily basis, uh, feed themselves, uh, you know, wash their face, brush their teeth, uh, take a shower or bath, get dressed, uh, use the bathroom, and. Uh, get in and out of the shower or walk into the shower, perform some sort of leisure pursuit activity, and 
go to work. <laughs> so when we first see our patients uh, in a clinic, uh, they may have um, what you would call, I guess, mild symptoms. And uh, the disease itself may not be uh, interfering a whole lot with their daily activities. They may notice, um, you know, some hand weakness, and that may affect their ability to uh, use a fork or use a knife to cut their food or perform a handwriting activity, uh, maybe button their shirt. So this is the order of operations, basically, that we uh, speak to in the very beginning of the disease. And you can see that's Donna on the left. She's our speech therapist. And she often addresses issues with uh, speech and swallowing. And then, of course, that's me in the center and Sarah. <clears throat> now, as the disease progresses, the order of operations change. So now, Sarah take, is front and center here because a person may have increased difficulty getting out of bed in the morning. So at that point, we'll talk about bed mobility and assistive devices and uh, adapted techniques to help the person get in and out of bed. <clears throat> And once they're out of bed, <clears throat> excuse me, they, um, they'll transfer uh, one way or the other, whether it be sit to stand or into a wheelchair or into a travel chair or into a, uh, a rolling commode, depending upon what their needs are. And then they'll go into the bathroom and typically do toileting activities um, and uh, followed by bathing. And it, it varies according to patient to patient how often these things are done, toiling more often sometimes than bathing. Uh, grooming, you know, is essential. Good oral hygiene is very important. Um, and, you know, people want to, you know, look good in their face. You know, people want their face washed, you know, their nails clipped, you know, nails done, you know, hair done, all that good stuff. And um, then finally getting dressed and having breakfast. Um, followed by who knows what. I mean, it depends. You may get to work and have to work, or you may just turn on the TV or, you know, whatever your priorities are at that time. So that, thank you. So that leads right into, um, as you can see, this could be a two-hour presentation as we talk about every possible thing that people could do. So what we've broken it down into then is I'm gonna start with the mobility, like we said, I'm gonna get you there, and then Mark's gonna talk to you about what you do once you get there. So mobility-wise, I'm gonna talk about how you will start in bed, how you're doing getting in and out of bed, how you're transferring, maybe how you're walking, and how, uh, if you're using a wheelchair. These are the typical things that I would recommend as a physical therapist if I talk to you about bed mobility. And if you've been in our clinic and you've, and you've seen us, then you know that I start out with, let's start at the beginning of, of your day. How are you getting in and out of bed? How are you getting out of the bed and walking around the room? So the first thing we, the equipment kind of things that we may recommend are getting bed rails for the bed changing the type of bed that you have, getting an adjustable bed, even going to the point of getting a hospital bed. These are the very typical recommendations made. But what are some tips? What are some tricks? What are some ideas that you might want to come up with before? Maybe you don't ever want a hospital bed. You know, that's not even something that's on your radar screen. So one of the first things I talk about, well, is it, what is it that you're looking for? Is it positioning? So maybe using wedges that you can just buy um, from a fabric store or from a place like that. Maybe that's enough to help you reposition yourself. If it's moving around in bed, that's the, that is something that you need assistance with. Maybe putting like an egg crate mattress at the where your feet are, so when you're pushing with your heels, you're actually getting a purchase on, the, on something and being able to push. Or we've had people put a box or an upside down trash can at the foot of their bed so they have something to push on. So these are just ideas that can help you uh, move. Using satin or sateen sheets make it so it's easier for you to move in bed. If you've ever worn flannel pajamas and then slept in flannel sheets, you know you really, you stick. So this is the opposite. And you can use this kind of trick 
in other places too, anywhere you're transferring onto something and you want to be able to slide a little more easily, use satin. Your leg position can really impact how you move and how you turn. So simply bending one leg up so that your knee flexes over more easily can make it easier for you to turn in bed. And that maybe is something that you can't do on your own, but the person helping you, if they come up and they bend your knee up and roll you over, it just makes it easier to move your hips. Using draw sheets is another trick that makes it so you don't have to grab onto that person. So putting a sheet across the bed, and they use this in hospitals. So if you've been in a hospital and you, you've seen the nurses or the CNAs use a sheet to help move you in bed, that's the kind of trick that we're now moving into the home. So you put a draw sheet on the bed and then instead of trying to grab an arm or a leg or pajamas to move the person, you can pull up help to pull the person up in bed. Now it's good if you have two people, so there's one on either side to pull up. But if not, you can maybe come around the top of the bed and, and pull from that direction. Again, this also helps in getting in a car. So maybe the, I can just shift onto the edge of the car seat, but I can't scooch back. If you sit onto a sheet first, the person can pull that sheet back and help you further into the car. So these are just some ideas, again, for the, the bed mobility. And then if a bed is really just not comfortable for you, we do have people who sleep in recliners, and it just makes it easier and safer for them. They can get up and down from the recliner independently, perhaps, because they use the, these are the stand-up recliners, those kind of recliners. And that's much easier than getting in and out of a bed. For transfers, we'll take it back to the basics again. We tell people to raise up the seat that you're sitting on. We tell people to use an uplift seat, which is one of those hydraulic seats that can fling you across the room. No, that just helps lift you up. Just seeing if you're awake. A pivot disc is like a lazy Susan that you, if you can stand up on it, and then the person would turn you on that. Transfer board helps to build a bridge between the two places that you're, where you're going from and where you're going to. A sit to stand lift is a lifting device as well as a Hoyer lift and then there are barrier free lifts. These are common pieces of equipment in that and often in that order that we recommend to people. But a, one of the first tips you may hear from us Mark or I, either one of us, is if you're going to stand up, sit in a seat that's where your hips are gonna be higher than your knees, so that you're always at a mechanical advantage. Now for me, I am five, three and a half. So that could be most of these chairs in the room. But if you're six, two, it's gonna make it a little bit harder for you to find a seat in the room to, to accommodate that. So you might need to carry cushions with you or choose chairs with armrests, which again, there's not really any in the room here. I was gonna go a little out of order, but anyway. So patio, when people say, well, what kind of cushion should I get? I actually recommend a lot of times you just go to like a hardware store and get a patio cushion, patio chair cushion, because they tend to be thicker and firmer they're waterproof, so if you spill something, you don't have to worry about that, and you can choose whichever pattern you want. But if, you know, they have the different types there, so those are just easy ones, and it doesn't look medical. You can raise up, if you're not um, raising the seat, raise up the whole item that you're gonna sit on. Maybe take the whole couch and put risers underneath the legs so the whole thing is lifted up and it's easier for you to get on and off of. Couches are really difficult places a lot of times for people, so a few other tips. Put a board between the cushions and the couch seat, or even put a pillow in between there. So now you've got it raised up, you've got a board, you've got pillows, and then put the cushions on so it looks like a regular couch 
but it's actually raised up so it's easier for you to get on and off because that whole thing is raised up. Platforms as well, like building a whole platform like this and then putting a, a recliner on it may make the difference between somebody being able to get up and down. Um, an aerobic step, these are an old thing, I don't even know if they use them anymore, but they were wider and bigger steps, so they were safer for people. If Say you need to get in and out of a SUV or a minivan and that higher height is a little difficult, use one of those bigger steps so it's easier to transfer up. And then a few, again, tips and tricks that people have told us about a Hoyer lift. They have the slings. Mark, color code the sling loops so that you know which ones to use. Put plastic underneath the base of where you're rolling it, like they do for desk chairs, so that it's easier to roll on a carpet. And then put moleskin on the edge of the sling so that it's a little bit more comfortable. So those are a few things for transfers. Of course, the big thing that physical therapists work with all the time is ambulation. So I talk to people about canes, rolling walkers, rollators, upright rolling walkers, which is the one with the gentleman with the yellow shirt, and then, of course, braces and orthotics. <clears throat> These are common recommendations. But what if you don't want to use a cane, but you need that little bit of extra balance and support? Walking sticks are nice replacements for that, as long as you can hold on to them. Using high top shoes or boots for people with a little bit of ankle weakness can give you that extra support. Um, and what I talk about with using these devices, and these are kind of just more tips to like to think about, not actual hands-on tips, are start to use a little bit more support when you're limiting your activity. So people will say to me, well, when should I start using a manual wheelchair? And I say, well, are you still going out? Are you not going to the parade or the show or the um, soccer game because you're afraid of falling or of uh, you're getting fatigued, that's when it's time to start. And it does conserve your energy to use these things. <clears throat> and then the last thing is that standing is great exercise. So people a lot of times will just go, well, I can't walk, I can't, I don't feel safe doing that. But you can still stand and that is still a great way to get some exercise and some weight bearing and it's good for your bones and bladder and everything. And then wheelchairs, we have manual wheelchairs, we usually start with transport wheelchairs, and then standard wheelchairs, scooters. Those are the things that you talk to your physical therapist about, we all know them. Get to know your therapist at your center. But here are some tips, is don't get your manual wheelchair with your insurance because your insurance will often just pay for one wheelchair, so you want them to pay for the higher end power wheelchair. So use an equipment loan closet of some sort or buy, sometimes people will get things used. <clears throat> if you're thinking about which style of, of wheelchair to use, if you're going to be mostly taking it out for indoor use, get a transport chair with the four little wheels. They're also easier for people to lift. They're lighter. So if the person who's your uh, caregiver or your loved one can't lift up a standard chair, take that kind of chair. But standard wheelchairs are more comfortable and better on uneven surfaces. So if you are going to that soccer game or if you are wheeling around in the streets of Philadelphia, you probably want a standard wheelchair. And always think about your position when you're in these, even if you just bought the wheelchair online off Amazon, you still have to think about, well, how am I positioned? And you still have to get cushions and seat th things, and pe foot plates can often still be um, dropped down. So don't just sit and think, I have to sit in it this way because it's the way it came. There are some adjustments that can still be made. Uh, wear your seatbelt, I just have to say. <laughs> That's a tip from me, your physical therapist. As far as the power wheelchairs then, portable power wheelchairs are not covered by insurance. 
but they are fantastic in between um, go-to kind of wheelchair for when you need to get out and about, but you don't want to use a high-end power wheelchair, but a manual wheelchair isn't enough. So we really do recommend these, whether you can, they would have to be privately paid. People have bought them used or um, had like beef and beers or something to raise money for them, but they're a great in-between. And there's a few extra little tips that we've learned from people over time. Uh, like for the foot plates is to put those car wash mitts that they, they're like lamb's skin, lamb's wool. Put those on the foot plates so they're more comfortable. Just buy gel pads that you can get for whether you're using it for your hands for typing. Buy those and put them on the wheelchair, the power wheelchairs for positioning. Um, bike phone holders can be used on wheelchairs. In fact, a lot of things that are made to go on bikes can be then put on your power wheelchair. Anything with a gooseneck clamp can be put around somewhere for you to use. So these are just things like just because the person has the power wheelchair and it's very medical, doesn't mean you can't add a few little extra touches and, thing, and to it. Now yeah. you're now you're going to do whatever it is you Yeah. <laughs> so once Sarah uh, you know speaks to mobility issues, um, my conversation, uh, dependent upon where the patient is with respect to the progression of the disease, uh, will determine what we talk about. So sometimes I feel like as an OT, um, I feel like I'm most beneficial to our patients when things start to get a little bit tough. So in the beginning of the disease, I've, you know, um, I do agree it's very important to get to know your patients and have them get to know you and establish, establish some sense of trust so they know who you are, what your name is, um, and what your purpose is uh, there for them. Uh, but honestly, in the very beginning of the disease, it's, um, you know, you were just, uh, we hope it's almost like a hello and goodbye, and we'll see you next time and see how you're doing. But once as the disease progresses, we see all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things. Um, everything from you know, hand weakness, transfer difficulties, um, uh, you know, speech and swallowing issues. Um, but in the beginning of the day, as you're getting out of bed and you're getting to your wheelchair, one of the first things you have to do uh, in the, uh, as the disease progresses is get to the bathroom. So some, the conversation that I have with patients uh, does uh, include toileting and toileting activities and how to be safe in the bathroom. You know, uh, patients of ALS do have a history of falling and falls can cause injuries. So a lot of our conversation is about fall prevention. Uh, in the beginning, we talk about grab bars, the benefits of using grab bars, why it's important to have grab bars. Um, and how grab bars can also can be beneficial not just for the patient but for anyone. I mean, uh, when it, on the rare occasion that we get to go to a hotel, um, uh, there typically are grab bars in the bathroom, and I'll find myself using one, you know, just uh, because it's there. Uh, as Sarah was saying, uh, hips over knees is a is a common recommendation that we have. Um, a way to uh, ensure that a person is sitting on a toilet with their hips over their knees is to recommend uh, a raised toilet seat. Uh, when a person's, you know, weakness develops and they have a hard time, you know, cleaning themselves, that responsibility typically falls on the caregiver and that can be quite cumbersome, um, sometimes humiliating, and if, um, and, and if you simply add a bidet to your toilet, it could make a world of difference for people. And sometimes we do get to laugh in the clinic and we say bidets are fun for the whole family and people do agree. <laughs> if you cannot get to the bathroom, then a commode chair could be quite helpful. Um, you could position a commode chair next to your bed um, or over your toilet if you can't get to the bathroom where um, you can use the armrest to help yourself get up. You can adjust the height of the commode uh, so those hips are over your knees. And commodes are uh, the one piece of equipment in the bathroom that insurance companies will pay for. Uh, the downside of recommending grab bars, erased toilet seats, and bidets is that they are self-pay. 
Um, at Temple, we are fortunate enough to have uh, the Alice Hope Foundation that often has fundraisers, raises money for all kinds of things, and one of those things is to provide equipment for our patients. Uh, so, if you're able to transfer to a commode, you may be able to also transfer to a rolling commode. And if your bathroom is accessible where that rolling commode can get into it, then you can position that over the toilet. So some semblance of normal toileting is possible. So when you cannot get to the bathroom, then alternatives often are discussed. In the di and if you can't get out of bed, then you typically need to rely on, of course, caregiver assistance, use of a bedside urinal, basically a plastic container. And then um, if that is impossible, then there recently, um, there's recently we've appreciated uh, the PureWick which is uh, an external catheter system that um, helps you with your toileting. And at first, uh, I thought they were only for women, but apparently there's a Purik for men as well. Some tips, like I was saying, grab bars can be installed in the bathroom to provide support to sit down, to stand up, and to move around. Um, toilet seat risers, they come in various sizes, so two, three, or four inches, depending upon your height. Um, the bidet helps perform personal hygiene, and you can use it with your existing toilet. Uh, some people are unaware of that. They think it, they have to have a separate device, but um, they're very mainstream today, and you can use it with your existing toilet. And um, like I said, a commode chair can be placed next to your bed. Um, for easy cleanup, there are uh, commode liners. So after you use the bathroom, your caregiver can just wrap it up and throw it out and uh, save a trip to the bathroom and the extra effort it takes to clean the commode. This is a picture of grab bars just to show you that they can be positioned uh, in many different places in the bathroom. You don't necessarily need this many, but you can see that they're vertical and horizontal and the heights uh, vary. So as our patients become weak and have increased difficulty getting themselves up from low services, which typically the toilet is, they'll find themselves using their towel rack or their toilet paper holder to help themselves get up. And we know that um, a towel rack weighs, a, a towel weighs a lot less than a person and a roll of toilet paper as well. So what happens is they usually come out of the wall and potentially cause a falls risk. So um, somewhere down the line, I guess years ago, um, a physiotherapist once said, you can use a grab bar like a towel rack but it's unsafe to use a towel rack like a grab bar. <laughs> so there is a concept that I've learned over the years called acceptance. Some people have a really hard time accepting this disease. And um, it's heartbreaking, you know, to uh, see that happen. So if we transform the house in a way that's more acceptable, then uh, more often than not, a patient will comply with your recommendations for safety. So these are just some examples of um, grab bars that don't necessarily look like a hospital piece of equipment. This is your bidet. Um, it goes on your normal toilet seat and you can see you can use it with a riser. <clears throat> this raised toilet seat has a hinge. So some of our patients can stand and urinate, but when they sit down, they need a little height to get up. So there's a riser that goes between your bowl and your seat, and it has a hinge so you can urinate uh, like you normally would in the bathroom. And then there's a raised toilet seat where you cannot close the lid, but it does have a locking device and armrests. <clears throat> so safety awareness is a must. So the raised toilet seat on the left, which is readily available, that a person may buy, does not lock, is unsafe, and is not a good choice. The raised toilet seat in the center has armrests and does lock, so that's a better choice. And the third option is a raised toilet seat where it's hard to see, it does lock on the side and it has its own lid. Lots of variations is the point there, so 
choosing the appropriate device can be challenging and confusing. So it's nice to be able to talk to a skilled clinician to discuss your choices and options. This tip is, uh, this is just a picture of a commode liner. Um, so uh, to help make uh, cleanup easier. <clears throat> a rolling shower chair can also be used bedside, um, positioned over a commode and rolled into the stall shower. Uh, bedside urinal can be used for urination if you have difficulty getting out of bed. And a Purik is designed for both women and men, offering a non-invasive option to manage urinary incontinence. These are some pictures of uh, rolling shower chairs. Uh, you can see the one on the left is very basic, PVC. Uh, not actually very supportive, so if someone has trunk weakness, that may not be the best choice. The one in the center is um, much more durable, uh, has footrests, and uh, has a built-in commode. And the one on the far right uh, has a tilt and space option, which is very good for a person who has neck weakness. Because quite often, you know, our patients develop neck weakness, they have a very hard time holding their chin up, it can be very uncomfortable, especially when they're transferring um, and moving around. So if we can tilt them back, it helps support their head. Oh, the pictures didn't show up there. Huh. That's weird. Okay. And these are just some pictures of the devices. Um, for bathing. Uh, we often recommend a shower chair, a tub transfer bench, handheld shower, long sponge, and a bath lift, and there are others as well. Um, energy conservation is a big issue for our patients as they do develop respiratory symptoms, uh, frequently get out of breath, and then when you're in a bathroom, I mean, that's very taxing on your respiratory system. So we often recommend uh, energy conservation techniques. Uh, one of them is sitting while you're showering, so we often recommend shower chairs or shower stools. Um, uh, we recommend handheld showers so you can direct a stream of water, uh, long sponges so you don't have to bend over, and uh, some people do prefer to take a bath, so they, there is a bath lift that can lower you into the tub and lift you out of the tub, but that is very expensive, um, sometimes um, unaffordable to some of our patients. We recommend that you simplify your routine. If, um, if uh, you can't get into the bathroom, there are products out there right now where you don't have to rinse them off so you can clean yourself. Uh, for fall prevention, you know, of course, uh, a mat in the shower, uh, the temperature of the water can make a difference for a person, and, uh, you know, plan your day so that you don't feel like you're in a rush. Take as many breaks as you need. Um, some people find that very challenging. Again, lots of different choices for uh, uh, bathroom equipment. To your left is a shower stool that has adjustable height, no armrests. Uh, shower stool, adjustable height with armrests, a shower chair, no armrests but has adjustable height, a shower chair with armrests with adjustable height, a tub bench, and um, another shower chair. So lots of different choices uh, and uh, you can see how sometimes it can be overwhelming and a person just doesn't know what to do or what to choose. So again, we're there for them to help them make the right decision. If you cannot step over your tub to get into the shower, the recommendation is to use a bench. You can see it's half in, half out. So this way, once you get into the bathroom, you can sit down first and then bring your legs over. Uh, if you cannot scoot yourself over, they do make a, a sliding tub bench where you can sit yourself down, the chair swivels, and then slide yourself over. Some tub benches have built-in commodes. Some tub benches can, um, fit over your toilet and then slide into the shower, depending upon what your bathroom configuration is. The one on the right is a rolling shower chair, so you can, uh, for, the, for the appropriate person, they can transfer out of bed onto that chair, make their way into the bathroom, use the toilet, and slide right into the shower. Someone suggested earlier, uh, it's important to lean into the disease, to plan ahead, to know what's coming. Uh, sometimes that's actually hard because a person is in various places with their acceptance of the disease. So you sort of the timing has to be kind of right. But I do believe and I do agree it is important to plan ahead because it's going to take the crises, hopefully take the crises 
out of your, uh, you know, out of your daily activities. This is the expensive tub lift I was referring to. You can see you could uh, possibly walk into the bathroom with your walker, turn around, sit down, and it can, uh, and then lift your legs over the tub, and it will lower yourself down so you could take uh, that bath that you love. More examples of grab bars and handheld showers. Quite often people will ask me, well, what do I do? How, what do I do with my shower curtain if, if the tub bench is half out? Well, somebody came up with an idea to um, uh, make a custom uh, shower curtain so that the water doesn't leave the shower, and you could easily make that yourself at home. Long handle sponges can be bent. Um, we highly recommend if your respiratory system is compromised that you try not to bend over at the waist when you're doing your daily activities. That includes washing your feet or putting your socks or shoes on. So there are assistive devices out there that can help you with that. This is a long-handled sponge. Some people have a hard time holding onto a bar of soap. So there's pump dispensers, there's bath mitts that can hold the soap, and there's a soap on a rope. What if I have a tracheostomy? Can I take a shower? Yes, you can. You could use a handheld shower and you can use a tracheostomy cover and try you know, to avoid directing the stream of water in that area. Now, this is, a, this is an inflatable uh, bathtub that goes in your bed and um, it's a little bit cumbersome to use, but it is an option that's out there if you have uh, enough support to make this work. The ideal setup, and again, planning for the future is important. The idea, if people, some people, some of our patients, you know, are accepting of their disease and they want to plan for the future and they ask, well, I'm thinking about renovating my bathroom. What do you recommend? Barrier-free roll-in shower is the ideal. You eliminate, you know, all trip hazards, no thresholds, and you get from your bed into your chair or right into your shower. For grooming, if a person is developing hand weakness, they make a myriad of devices that can help you. A couple of them are these universal cuffs that can hold onto an electric razor or uh, a standard razor. Uh, these devices work. You don't even have to use your fingers. It's basically, it's strapped onto your hand. So, you know, my job is to assess your upper extremity strength. So I'll look at your, your neck, your shoulder, your elbow, forearm, wrist, and hands and determine what assistive devices are gonna work best for you. They have battery operated nail clippers now. Um, I'll look at a person's grip strength, their pinching strength. There's three pinches that everybody uses. There's the key pinch or lateral pinch. There's a tip pinch, which is like, I call it a threading the needle pinch, or there's a three finger pinch, which is like turning a knob. So nail clippers are like one of the hardest things to use for some reason. They're very poorly designed. They're on a swivel, they're very thin, but yet people need to cut their nails, you know, if that's what they choose to do. So they do uh, make an adapted nail clipper which uses a more of a gross assist where you're using the palm of your hand to clip your nails rather than pinching. Our patients with ALS, we see they develop this thinner atrophy. It's very common um, where you lose your opposition. Your thumb will not rotate so it's lined up with your index finger or your index finger and your long finger. So you wind up coming in on a lateral side. Um, so it makes it very hard to do these fine motor activities, nail clipping, holding a pencil, pen, there's so many. Uh, some of the common recommendations for dressing include a reacher, a sake, dressing stick, vel Velcro closure so you don't have to worry about buttons. An elastic waistband is, one, is a highly recommended uh, ad adaptation to your daily routine because nothing is worse than standing up when you're getting dressed and having your pants fall down to your ankles. So elastic waistband will keep it at your waist. So as an OT, we look at how do we get our pants on over our feet to our knees and how do we get our pants on from our knees over our hips. So if we can keep our pants between our knees and our hips, it makes it a lot easier uh, to complete that dressing activity. Elastic shoelaces, they turn a, a, a tied sneaker into a slip-on, which is good for energy conservation. You can use that with a long shoe horn or just simply get slip-on shoes. Energy conservation includes sitting, sitting to get dressed, having your clothes ready the night before, 
putting your weaker side in first. If your left side is weaker than your right and you're trying to put your shirt on or your coat, you want to put your weaker side in first and then use your stronger side to finish up the activity. <clears throat> These are pictures of some of the equipment. More pictures. More pictures. More pictures. For eating, there's loads of adaptive equipment out there. Um, if you ever have a patient or you yourself are having difficulty with a daily activity, all you have to do is put the word adapted in front of it and you'll find lots of choices. So if you're having a hard time handwriting, you write adapted handwriting devices. If you're having a hard time feeding yourself, you can write, uh, you can type in, you know, to Google or whatever, adapted utensils. So these are just a few that can help with, um, with uh, your eating activities. You could have, use built up hand utensils, um, plate guards, which, which clip to the side of your plate so that the food doesn't fall off when you're trying to um, scoop it up. Uh, Non-slip mats keep the plate still and uh, straws help uh, sip or drink fluids as long as you, know, you don't have any aspiration precautions but have a hard time holding on uh, to a cup or a glass. <clears throat> Some adapted utensils are bendable. Some people lose, you know, we have a lack of appreciation for something called radial deviation. That's your ability to turn your wrist towards your thumb. If you lose that ability, then you'd be surprised how hard it is actually to bring the utensil to your mouth. So we can adapt the utensils and make that happen. My esteemed colleague, Sarah and I, All right, that was it. There it is. I don't know what happened. Keep talking. Talk okay. about tips and tricks. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Yes, dear. Is there still something called a feeding machine? Yeah, you oh, yeah. We had a picture of that. I'm not sure what happened to it. But yes, there is. There is a feeding machine. Um, so there is something. Uh, there's uh, now the, 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 so the OB feeding machine is, Here it is. what's more popular now. Um, if uh, a person wants to purchase one, and if it's a priority for the patient and their family to eat together rather than be fed, uh, you can set uh, up a feeding machine and it will scoop up the food and bring it to your mouth. Has that gotten better since the one like 10 years ago? The one from 10 years ago was the Windsor feeder, and it basically works the same way. Okay. Not yeah. I, I honestly, I feel like they're very cumbersome, and at that stage of the disease process, quite honestly, I feel like the patient and the caregiver is a bit overwhelmed at that point and just doesn't have the time and luxury to do that. So it really depends on the person. One more question. Is that feeder, is there like a timer where you can choose how long Well, you can control it by sometimes it's a chin switch or another type of device. So uh, depending upon you know, what is working, you can activate the switch and, and set the pace yourself. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. All right, so somehow we got jumped ahead. So here you are back here. Okay, so these are just more tips and tricks for people who, um, you know, or maybe have some hand weakness and they want to continue keyboarding. So as you can see on the left, that's a, a typing aid. So if you don't have the use of your fingers, but you have some decent elbow range of motion and strength, you can use those to, um, you can use that to uh, access a keyboard. Uh, Oop. That's okay. And then on the left is a, that's a ergonomic forearm support. So once again, if a person has uh, very weak shoulders, I love the ergonomic forearm supports because um, if your shoulder is weak and your elbow strength, your hand strength is working, you're kind of stuck here. The job of the, you know, your, your shoulder is responsible for reaching out there. 
And if you just don't have any shoulder strength, you're kind of stuck here. But you'd be surprised if you put your patient uh, on one of these ergonomic forearm rests, or you yourself find yourself having shoulder weakness, then your tricep can actually assist your shoulder to reach forward. And then typing aids, where if you're holding, if you're having a hard time holding onto a pen or pencil, there are devices out there that can hold onto pen, pencils, paint brushes, markers, whatever. I've often helped artists, you know, use their hands uh, during the progression of their disease to continue their craft using some of these devices. All right, so the one tip, we didn't want to go a lot into computer access, but, um, what? Three minutes. Three minutes. But um, to start with, if you're starting to have difficulty using your computer, whether it's a PC or a Mac, go into the operating system. Built into both of these systems, both on a PC and a Mac, are, um, accessibility features, ease of access in the Windows platform and its accessibility, that little um, guy in the blue circle for Mac. So just go ahead and look at that. There, there's speech options, there's mouse options, there's keyboard options. It's a great way to start and it's built in. You don't have to buy anything new, you don't need any new software. So that's a start for that, the little tips. And then a tip that came up just in a conversation during the day that I just wanted to add was people are usually now a lot of um, smart technologies, like the smart speakers like Alexa or Google Home, and they can do a lot of things for you. They can run things in your home, they can run your lights, they can answer the doorbell, they can call people on the phone. So that's another tip is to look into some different options for using consumer available devices like that. This is a, an old picture, doesn't have Dr. Ostro on it and has a few extra people, but this is an old picture, but this is our team and this is who we've worked with and this is like, um, who helps support us, like Mark mentioned early on, it's not just me seeing the person and talking about their mobility and then him seeing the person and talking about their hand function. It's all of us as a team looking at you as an individual, as a whole person and trying to determine what is best for you and you telling us what you're interested in, what your needs are. So I would like, first I'd like to thank the MDA, and Mark and I would both like to thank the MDA for all the support they've given us for the past 20 years. Um, again, thank you to the ALS Hope Foundation. As Mark mentioned, they pay for a lot of these items that you've seen uh, so that we do have the opportunity to give them out to people. Um, thank you to our neurologists who support the work that we do and have always thought that the rehab team, the speech ther therapist, um, occupational therapists and physical therapists were important team members. Um, and especially thank you to the people living with uh, ALS and their caregivers and their loved ones. And they're the ones who keep asking us about the technology and asking us about the equipment and asking us how we can do things. And that's what drives us and, and leads us to keep searching for the answers and for sharing their tips with us. Like, they're the ones who say, I can't use a knife, but I can use a pizza cutter. Yeah, so that's where the tips come from. So thank you.